The 1989 Race Across America would begin at the Orange County Fairgrounds in Costa Mesa, California. The field of racers would consist of 25 men and three very adventuresome women. Susan Notarangelo would be the only veteran woman returning. The other two rookie entrants would be Kathy Busby of South Carolina and Diane Owens of Texas. For everyone, the chance to compete in the race across America would be an experience of a lifetime. They would be racing 2,910 miles across deserts, mountains, and through all weather conditions. There would be no time out for sleep, meals, or mechanical breakdowns. Just to attempt this race would be an incredible accomplishment. The route would take them from California through America's heartland before their finish at the George Washington Bridge in New York. And our last rider of the introductions, a veteran of many ultra marathon events, the winner of Ram 85 from Harvard, Illinois, riding a Terry bicycle sponsored by Nike, Cycle Stars, and LT Helmets, Susan Notarangelo. That's it. Is that over yet? Uh, when we leave California, we're all together, you know, for the first 60 miles. And it's a time where it's, it's about the only time you see all the Ram Riders um, within a hundred miles of that point. You may never see anybody again, the same, you know, the same people again. So it's the only time all the Ram Riders are together. And we, we ride like that for 60 miles. and then. It's so called the gun goes off and everybody sprints at their own capacity and you know kind of settles into a race position. This year I feel more of a commitment to go out and, and start out hard with the with the competition as as close as it is with uh, Kathy Busby and uh, Patty Jones all being a pretty good hill climbers. I feel like if I don't go out real fast and, and really work my, a good maximum effort the first 24 hours, that they're just going to you know, spring off the front and they'll have all this energy and all this excitement because they're ahead of Susan or Angela, that I may have a hard time catching them. By dawn of the second day, Susan led the women into Arizona and up the steep climb to the historic mining town of Oatman. She had moved into 10th position in the men's field and was nipping at the heels of her longtime friend, Bob Harding of St. Louis. Although not known for her hill climbing ability, she would continue to move up in the men's division during the long grades of the Arizona mountains. Her experienced crew would consist of Phil Cole, Dick Nepple, her husband Lon Haldeman, Mike Grogan, Margaret Ardelt, and Lee Mitchell. She would be joined at the Mississippi River by longtime friend Fritz Merricke and father-in-law Ed Haldeman, who would add new life and enthusiasm to a tired crew. All crew members had to be proficient at a variety of duties. Driving, navigating, mechanical work, and feeding Susan were all routine responsibilities. When Susan would stop for a rare break, everyone had a job to do. She usually would stop less than two minutes, and during the entire day would usually be off the bike less than 30 minutes. With only two vans and no motorhome, Susan's crew would become very efficient at keeping Susan comfortable. When it was time for bed, one of the vans would make motel arrangements 30 miles up the road. Susan would then arrive for a two to three hour night's sleep. After a total body massage, she would then be out the door at dawn for another 320 mile day. Um. I talked to mom today a lot, and she was asking me, well, how far are you going to ride without sleeping? I said about 650 miles, but I've ridden farther than that at Paris Press Paris. 
complaint. Hopefully it gets... Last night in Amboy, didn't it? No. It seemed very familiar. A little rappy tour. Yeah. Well, it was 30 degrees cooler than 118. Yeah, at least... I, I think that day was the hardest day of my life on a bike. Yeah. That was bad. Yeah. Well, at least Altman was cooler. Yeah. Susan's success so far in the race across America was not surprising considering her past transcontinental accomplishments. In 1982, Susan set the first woman's transcontinental record of under 12 days by crossing the country in 11 days, 16 hours. In 1983, she teamed up with her husband, Lon Haldeman, on a tandem bicycle, and they set a new record of 10 days, 20 hours. In 1985, Susan won the race across America with a winning women's record of 10 days, 14 hours. In 1986, she returned with her husband Lon Haldeman to again set a new mixed couples tandem record of 9 days, 20 hours. As Susan neared Albuquerque, New Mexico, she was right on her record-setting pace. The fast 50 mile an hour descent into town was one of the highlights of the race. Her goal would be to reach Tucumcari, New Mexico near the 970 mile mark before she slept that evening. However, late night thunder showers would slow her pace and she would be forced to sleep in Santa Rosa near the 900 mile mark. Okay. That woman sure does look good there. And we noticed that. We found out she had to buy a new pair of tights this year. Maybe somebody will give her some. Wishful thinking. Uh, Have you heard anything in the latest? Have you heard anything of the latest on Diane? No, I'm sorry, I don't have any figures on her. I'll try to get something at the next station. Thank you. Hasta la bye-bye. After the first day of the race, it's a rarity that riders ever see each other again. Today would be very special as Susan would leapfrog positions with Johnny G across the panhandle of Texas. She would then be caught and ride with Mike Trail of Washington for several minutes as he too was near the group. Al Muldoon of Michigan was also in close proximity and Al and Susan would again trade positions numerous times for the remainder of the race. Makes it. There she Okay, 1,000 miles. 1,000 down. Okay. Uh, could I have a piece of turkey, rolled up piece of turkey, or okay. roll up a piece of bread with the turkey around it? Or other way. <laughs> have a bread sandwich? What? Have a bread sandwich made out of turkey? Yeah, I just want one piece of bread and one turkey. Okay.
to Concari, New Mexico, and then that's where I actually get off US uh, 40 and head on um, kind of northeast into Kansas. And that day, I think, will be difficult because it'll, it'll, the heat will be there. It'll be, you know, hopefully it won't be 90, but it could be between 90 and 95 all day. And then the moisture of the Midwest starts hitting you and, you know, then you're tired. And as you roll into that area, it's nice and flat and, boy, it's just wonderful. Are you going um, to set the record of nine days in four hours? I'm going to try. We worked real hard for the Feel first pretty good about days. it right now? Microphone in front of What else was the purpose of the I got first it. You days? Want it. If I could have sat back there with Diane and just come in and under 10 too. Because as you're as you're setting right now, I mean, you know, Casey was asking me yesterday, how how are you? How's your schedule in relationship to to the record? You know, like like that was the big thing to set. And I said, well, ten days, two hours, that that isn't really even the goal. I said we're we're looking at something a lot more ambitious than that. You know, and when I showed her uh, your schedule, I think she was kind of surprised that uh, that's that's what you were really shooting for. You know, when Cindy started, we were shooting for nine days, twenty three hours. So, you know, it's still, it's st still, still within your, your reach, you know. But I think the thing that's most important is that you're, you know, you're, you're riding up to your full potential. And you, you kind of start hitting Kansas, and all of a sudden you're dropped into Lower Kansas, which is nothing but these huge hills. And I think that'll be a, a difficult day for me. I've never enjoyed riding through Kansas. It's, it's, it's a 400 mile. The state is 400 miles long, and it's, you know, it seems like you enter Kansas one day and it takes you three days to get across it. It doesn't. It takes a day and a half, but it's, it, it just is overwhelming. You're just in Kansas for so long. It's the longest state you're in, and it's, uh, it's very, I find it very monotonous, and just the scenery doesn't change. It's either hills or it's flat, but it's just, there's no, there's the population. There's no people. There's no cars. I find Kansas very boring, and it also be fun. The only good thing about Kansas is that it's connected to Missouri. Um, Missouri is my home state. Uh, I was born and raised in St. Louis, and it's uh, 240 miles from the southern tip of Missouri to St. Louis, and that's where all my family will be, my mom and dad. Um, my baby's staying there, but I won't get to see her. So it'll be a real, real encouraging push to, to ride through Missouri as hard as I can so that, you know, maybe I could stop and get a hug from my mom or something. If I waste too much time before then, I won't even be able to get hugs from anybody. No, that's fine. I really quit. I've had it. I hope to make uh, the Mississippi River in six days even, uh, so that I'm sleeping on the um, east side of the river on, uh, on Saturday morning, um, you know, about four o'clock in the morning. Then I'll wake up and all my friends from Illinois are coming down. Um, Tom Spanadea said he'd come down to ride with me a little bit. The McKennas are coming down. Um, even Bill and Dawn said they may try to come down. So. Even if nobody comes down, behind every corner I'll be looking for them. Uh, and hopefully I'll beat them across. I think Indianapolis is, is 800 miles from the finish line, about that. So now you ride a double century and you're, you know, you're only 600 miles. And you ride another little double century and you're, only, you're halfway there. And, and all of a sudden the, the race, to me it's like the race is almost over. And every mile you ride, you're, you're, you're finishing the race now versus the middle section, you're just kind of out there in the ozone. In the beginning, you can feel the race, and then in the middle, you're just out there in the, in the middle of nowhere, 
And then once you hit like Indianapolis, you're down in the hundreds of miles to finish. There's nothing left but just a couple double centuries. And I think it, it adds a spark to the race and hopefully it'll add a spark to my riding. For this year's Race Across America, Susan would be taking part in a special test to determine the long-term effects of sleep deprivation on marathon cyclists. Before the race, Susan would be tested several times to establish a base for which she could be compared to during the race. Her heart and other vital signs would also be tested before, during, and after the race to determine any long-term side effects. During the race, Susan would have several electrodes attached to her head at all times. During her two-hour sleep breaks, these would be connected to a recording machine, which would then be able to compare her sleep patterns from night to night. Fortunately, although Susan was beginning to show the signs of fatigue, her brain and sleep patterns remained almost normal throughout the whole race. Then we hit Parkersburg, West Virginia, and we're on this big expansive four lane, which isn't an interstate, but it looks just like an interstate. It's a nice shoulder. Um, and in West Virginia, it's where you start climbing. Um, I don't really think it's the Appalachians, but it's, it's mountains where you may climb for 10 or 15 minutes of actual climbing and then go down the other side in three minutes and then, then all you do is climb again. So you really start your climbing. I think Parkersburg is about 550 miles from the finish. But mainly it's up and down and up and down until you find another valley that they've routed you through. Um, I don't think it's any more difficult than the Appalachian Mountains. In fact, I think it's easier because up into the point of Parkersburg, you haven't been climbing. You've been rolling around, you know, uh, you know, Illinois and Indiana and Ohio, but you haven't done any climbing. Um, I just hope that my own mind, that I'm, I have a clear mind, so that when I make my descents, my descents, I can I can be a safe descender. That's all I hope. I'm looking forward to finishing up in New York because Rebecca will be there and my mom and dad. They haven't seen a finish since 1982 when I did my first transcontinental record. And I'm, I really want to do well because they're taking the time to, to come to New York to you know, out of their busy schedule. They're bringing my baby and my nephew and um, I have a lot of relatives in New York because my dad is originally from Terrytown. When I win, I'll, I'll get my trophy, the, the transcontinental trophy. I'll win Ram, but I'll also get to visit my family in New York City, and that, that also is very special to me. Shortly after midnight, Susan arrived at the George Washington Bridge, cheered by a handful of friends and family. Race Across America director John Marino, along with past Ram winners Casey Patterson and Elaine Muriel, would present Susan with her trophy. Susan's new record of nine days, nine hours, and nine minutes would have beat all of the men in the first three years of Ram. Her crew had been perfect and was proud to have been involved in such a physical and mental effort by Susan. This race concluded a year of planning, dedication, and focusing on one goal, and highlighted a career of five transcontinental records. It was now time to hold her daughter Rebecca and return to their hometown of Harvard, Illinois. Susan Norner Angel.
Angelo. Whereas Susan Nordlangelo recently won first place in the race across America, and whereas Susan Nordlangelo has received this first place competition for riding a bicycle from Costa Mesa, California to George Washington Bridge, New York City in nine days, nine hours, and nine minutes. I want to congratulate you, Susan. I think